Hey, 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 hey. Enjoy. Check, check. Hi, everyone. Thank you so hey. much. Uh. So Brandon just got off the plane, so we have to give him an extra thanks for making <laughs> it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, I'm really excited to, to talk with you, Brandon, and especially I joined Kickstarter a year and a half ago, so it was after De La Soul ran their, uh, their campaign, and um, so I have a lot of questions based on not having been there for that part of it, um, and, um, you know, Brandon is uh, their manager, but he's also a marketing expert, and, um, you know, I think being a manager is one of the most challenging roles that there are in our business. Um, you sort of have to be a CFO, a, a CEO, run the ship, organize everything. But it's also artists have emotional needs that are really um, reasonable, and you have to be able to respond to those and, and encourage them. So I think it's a very laudable role that you have. Um, but if you don't mind, could you share a little bit about what, uh, you know, how you got to working with De La Soul and, and what you were doing prior to that? Um. I, I started off at Columbia Records um, as an intern. Um, started off as an intern, worked my way up um, to eventually running the rap division at Columbia Records. Left the music industry to get into retail. Um, through retail, through, through working in the rap division, I noticed that um, we were creating a lot of trends. Right. We were selling sneakers, we were selling t-shirts, we were selling hats. Influencing um, tons of categories. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we, rappers were influencers. Right. So um, being on the inside of that, I seen, I seen a market in retail where I can sell sneakers and sell clothing. Um, so left the music side, got in the retail side. And actually on the retail side, um, I actually learned more about the music business being on retail than actually in the music business. And you mean learned about the business in terms of what could be done better or what yeah, was happening? Yeah, so in the, in the music business, um, when I started, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of communication between artists and fans. Yep. There wasn't anything direct. So when, when, I, when I started, um, when I opened up my clothing store, I seen the direct communication with customers. Right. So we had a direct dialogue, which I noticed music never really had. Right. It was always like we threw stuff out there and we just hoped people got it. We didn't know who those people were. Yep. We would do shows and then, you know, notice a couple of faces in, in certain cities. But um, there was never that real direct communication. That's right. Um, so in retail, I learned a tremendous amount of how to deal with people directly and, w and what people really want. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's fascinating. And I think about that a lot in that, you know, the sort of the A&R role is the one in our industry that seems to have a lot of, of the sort of value, you know, it's just like a set of golden ears. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and, but really there's, there's so much, and now I think data is driving so much, and we know that from steam, streaming, and we see how it's affecting trends and, and A&R decisions. So it's sort of flipped a little bit, but yeah. that's, that's great. And then you started, how did you start to work with Dela? Well, I, I've, I've known them for a while. Um, my, my partner um, that I work with, Smiles, he's, he's been working with the group forever. Right. Um, and, and he does all the touring, he does all the road work. Um, and, and you came in as sort of the marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They 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 were they were progressing in their in their career, um, and they wanted to do new stuff, and they and they needed help. So right. that's when Smiles called me in. I met with the guys. We sat down. Um, they actually listened to all my crazy ideas, and we just started working. Well, I mean that that's kind of amazing. I mean, when I think of De La Soul, and I was in high school, a senior in high school in 1989 when Three Feet High and Rising came out, and so like, I was that was a tape I bought, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a tape. Um, totally, <laughs> and uh, and you know they're they're. That album is respected for being not just you know influential and innovative in hip hop, but in music, and it's inspired so many. And you know, one of the things that Brandon and I were talking about is sort of how do we get to today? Is you know the the decisions that you had to make in 1989 and the innovative uh, you know aspects of that album are kind of one of the challenges that ended up manifesting later on. So they were using samples of different kinds of artists and and putting it on a record, a CD, and a tape was one thing, but the 
nobody anticipated what those challenges would look like when the, the business turned to streaming. And I think that's one of the, the things, obviously, that affected you all as you, you know, they released many more albums. But yeah. when it came time to sort of, you know, I think in, in 2014 was when, um, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about what entered that decision, where the group was and where you all were with, with your fans that made you to say, we kind of need a new connection there. Yeah, um, so, yeah, their past definitely dictated how we moved in the future, how we move now. Um, so, starting back with Three Feet High and Rising, um, they basically formatted how rap albums are created. Um, from the sampling, from the skits, right. um, they created what is now considered a good rap album. So right. if you listen to a Kendrick Lamar album and you hear how a Kendrick Lamar album is broken down, De La, they created that format. Um, and so, but with, with all innovators, there's like, there's like hurdles. Um, so right. the way they created albums by using other people's music and sampling, um, there wasn't a lot of laws in place um, like there is now. So they got sued. So they did a lot of things. They used a lot of stuff. Um, they were just kids at the time, just being creative. And they weren't the only stuff. ones who were doing this. I mean, Beastie Boys notoriously, yeah, people were, right? right yeah. uh, other, other, other bands were doing this, but they, they became the guinea pigs of the legal departments. Right. They, they, they actually created the sample legal department. Like, they, right. because of them so they're now. they're job creators. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so basically, they got sued for using music that wasn't cleared. They used a lot of, a lot of, a lot of other records um, within their music, and they got sued. So moving forward, um, as the as their career progressed, we found out that the, because the music wasn't cleared, we couldn't use it. Right. So as, as iTunes came involved, as streaming became involved, because there was these legal binds on, re on songs that weren't cleared because of samples, these, these songs were now unavailable because we couldn't clear them. And one thing that I, I noticed when I was sort of re reading back on some of this time was that, and, and we don't really talk about it too much, but when we work with record companies, people change. And yes. sometimes transfers are right. So like the catalog was transferred at some point to ownership by a, a new entity. And there was all of these, this sort of bumpy road. And so the person who would have the most experience or who would have the most research or whatever the, the information is to maybe solve the problem is out of the picture. Yes. And, and when you have a, an, an artist like De La Soul with a career as long and varied that's a real issue, and it's, it's, there's no simple solution to it, but it is a, an aspect of, of sort of how you end up, you know, with what's in front of you. So cut to 2014 when you're like, we want to keep doing creative work. We have a new idea, and you had this great idea. And that, was that yours, the, the BitTorrent idea? Yeah, well, it, the, to, to give away the catalog, so... It, I'd it, love to hear the... I think we could hear all the details of that. <laughs> great. So, um, so, yeah, so... Because the catalog wasn't available due to sampling, um, there was a there's a piece of cult the, there's a cultural piece of hip hop history that was basically missing from the world. Their records yep. aren't available. Yep. Um, and every day I would see on Twitter, Facebook. Why people, isn't it there? Yeah, where, where can I get where it? Can yeah. I get the, where can I get these albums? Where can I get this music? Why isn't it available? Um, and it was literally daily, like daily. Every single day there was more and more people. So. Um, just trying to figure out a way to make this catalog available, because technically the catalog was available right. Ill illegally. Right. So, so everybody was, had access to it. it yeah. Yes. You, if, if, if you if you know how to use a torrent, if you know how to find MP3s, you can find the songs. But the average person, they just they don't have time. They don't know how to do it. They don't. They just don't give a fuck. Right. Um, so trying to figure out a way, like, okay, how can we re-expose this? piece of culture to a new audience. Um, on Valentine's Day on, in 2014, we decided just to give the catalog away. Right. Um, it was something that's never been done. It was at a point in time where 
um, everybody in the music industry is, is fighting for percentages and they want more, more streaming income, they Micro want pennies. more money, yeah. yeah, fighting for pennies. <laughs> Um, so we decided, like, okay, we don't care about pennies. We just want people to have the music. Right. So we decided just to give everything away. Um, and during that process, I mean, when we, when we decided to give it away, we only thought, like, you know, 20,000 people would just come and download it, and they would be happy. Right. So what, what, what ended up happening was for their 25th anniversary, um, for, 20, for 25 hours, we released the entire catalog for free on Valentine's Day, and we gave it away as an act of love, as a, as a gift of love on Valentine's Day. <laughs> um, and we only expected 20,000 to 30,000 people tops. Right. What ended up happening was we ended up having 3 million people in 25 hours. That's crazy. Download the catalog like it was. So I the can't tourists even say were the like solving each other. Yeah, we the broke whole time. <laughs> every single server you can possibly have. Um, but you were also collecting. Email addresses, right? Yes. Like, right. Yes, so, yes. I mean, as a smart marketer, you yes. knew that that was the point of connection that you had an opportunity with. Like, and nobody had a problem with offering that email address. They probably no. would have given you the name of their first kid if you asked them for it, but you didn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, well, the, the the deal the deal was exactly that. Um, give us your email. We'll give you we'll give you the music. Right. Um, it's our personal gift, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll let you have it. Yeah. Um, and we collected hundreds of thousands of emails. Um, and, th and that became the base of our new communication tool. So like, you know, everybody uses Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or whatever. Our, ma our main thing is email, because that, that's, that's where our audience lives. Yep. Um, and that's, that's been our tool ever since. It's but amazing. Yeah, so, so, we, so to date, we've, with that campaign, we collected over 500,000 emails. Um, and we, had, we, we have an open rate of like, we send emails out, we have an open rate of like 55%. Yeah, um, I sent one out last week, I got 5%. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was pretty so, bad. Um, so yeah, 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 so. And you had, your open rate is much higher. Yes, 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 yes. Because yes. those are the really passionate, engaged fans that want to support you. Yeah, they, they, right. they, they really care. Um, yeah. they, we, we gave them something that was missing in their lives. Like, right. those, like those albums were, were, were a big part of, you know, their childhood, growing up, college, young adulthood, yep. and it was missing. So us being able and to give that gift. the new generation was hearing about it or seeing it on YouTube or whatever it was, exactly. and they didn't have it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Which is amazing. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the sort of markers of, you know, y you and De La Soul being innovative and uh, sort of coming at things with a, a fresh look and one that, you know, obviously the industry, if you will, was probably terrified of. But yeah. it was, and it was brave. But yeah. you, you sort of... It was were, scary. Yeah, you were willing to sort of take that. And I think that, you know, people shut up. That's what you hope. And so that was 25 hours in, in February of 2014. And yeah. then, um, so I assume over the next year, as you're plotting what the next creative um, plan was, making the next album, yeah. um, you know, the... Uh, I know a little bit about the story, but I wasn't at Kickstarter at the time, but um, could you tell me sort of like how the conversation um, came about Kickstarter? And my understanding is you needed to be convinced. You were the one who was like, I'm well, not sure. Yeah, <laughs> well, so um, prior to giving the catalog away, they, they already started recording. They right. had this idea on how they wanted to make this next record. Um, but just know, just, just, a, just an idea, just like, okay, we want to create this album. Um, we want to have a lot of features on it. We don't know what we're going to do, but you know, we had to figure out ways to draw interest, right? right. So the catalog giveaway was was part part of gaining interest for new momentum, more, yeah, yeah. For, for for more product. Um, and the the Kickstarter idea um, it actually came from a friend of theirs and a friend of mine, Howard. Yes. Uh, How, How, Howard Cho mentioned it to to the guys, and they were like. Yeah, why not? You know what I mean? Because they're, 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 the guys, they're, they're, they're adventurous. They're real creative. They, they, um, they march to their own drum. They right. always want to break ground. They always just want to do something new. Adventurous is a really good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah just super adventurous. <laughs> so when, when they first mentioned Kickstarter, to me, I'm like, it felt like a huge risk. Right. Like, because if it doesn't work, what does that mean? 
You know what I mean? For sure. Um, so I wasn't necessarily convinced, right. but if the artist wants to do something, you got to figure it out. Well, this is sort of like going back to your, your manager hat. I mean, this is a, an issue that comes up for all managers. That sometimes the artist has a wacky idea, and it's really, you know, maybe it isn't a good yeah. thing to do. And you, you know, you're the one that's sort of got to be um, advising them as a business person, but you also want to support their creativity. It's, yeah. it's tricky. Yeah, because, I mean, in regard to Kickstarter, they were so sure of it. They were just like, this is what we're doing. And I'm just kind of like, ah. Which was really brave of them because yeah. at that time, you know, there had only been one project that had, um, you know, I think raised more than, than what they ended up raising. Um, and they, uh, you know, it was probably took a lot of, you know, a, a leap of faith for them to, to know that their fans would be there. Yeah, well, I, I thought it was dangerous because we're rap. And I didn't think our audience would understand. Sure. Because I was like, you know, people think we're begging for money. Right. And like, how come you don't have a record deal? Yep, like, yep, yep. You know, people are used and to And these are all common forms. things that people give us feedback uh, with at Kickstarter, you know, and we, we have lots of ways that we, we think it, it can be different. But I think certainly when with a genre like hip hop and you're, you know, you have a certain experience and understanding of your audience, that, that's a, a reasonable concern. Yes, yes. So, but after, after figuring out the platform, learning a little bit more, um, I just discovered the, the tremendous opportunity in it. Um, and then I realized the communication that we have with our fans that we don't necessarily need the public at large. We can just rely on our fan base. Right. Um, and we have that direct communication. Right. So um, going forward, it was like, all right, so you looked I at, get you it. talked to some labels too, right? You looked at what yeah. things were being offered and what, yeah. what those things looked like, for, but for where well, you were. For the, the type of record that they wanted to create, a label just wasn't the answer. Like, you know, they have a song on the album called Drawn, which is almost six minutes. And for the first like four minutes, they're not even on it. Right. And then they only rhyme for 30 <laughs> seconds at the right, end. Right, so you can so imagine it's like, some A&R guy going, uh, yeah. I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, right. and they, yeah. So they wanted the creative control to make the record that they knew was what they was in their heart. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's exactly. awesome. So, so then Kickstarter became the obvious platform because it was like, okay, um, we can do whatever the fuck we want. Right. Like it, they're like it's what the we give it directly to the fans. Right. And 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 another another crazy thing was though, like the fans didn't know what we were making. So it was yeah. like it was it was it was, it was also yeah, yeah it was it was an extreme leap of faith because they thought you know it's a tr traditional hip hop De La Soul album. They didn't realize we were making these crazy records. So, right. Um, right. Right. So the platform just became the right thing because it was just all a big experiment. But I, I, talking to Howard, who ended up uh, project managing, uh, I think the, the campaign on yes. the sort of like utility side of it, um, he he described a, a planning that I was very refreshed to hear. There's a lot of music. Uh, campaigns don't understand how much work it takes and sort of estimating, uh, projecting what your numbers are going to be, you know, hoping for a certain goal at a certain mark so that that sort of drives momentum. And obviously, yeah. you know, we as a, as a, a platform want to support those projects that are, you know, having that momentum. But, you know, what he described to me was like, we wanted to be at X percent by X time, yes. and but you funded it in one day, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Like Not you, you eight blew, hours. You blew, you blew through it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, our, our, our funding goal on Kickstarter was 110,000, and we made that in eight hours. Right. Like se se seven, seven, seven or eight hours. So Which yeah. is tremendous. I yeah. mean, it's and and obviously you hope with big campaigns like this, we we also hope that they will be far exceeding their goal. Um, you ended up raising 600 plus thousand dollars from yes. 11,000 fans. And, um, you know, that is, that for when I look at that as a, as a business person, someone who's worked in music for 25 years and all different aspects of it, that to me is a tremendous demonstration of savvy, of, on an economic front, Kickstarter takes 5% plus credit card fees, like, you know, and then, and then for the creative leverage. And I know that, um, you know, from then on, you still there's a lot of work to do. You had to yes. finish the record, and then you had to decide on a street date. Um, before then, you also needed a partner to yes. do 
get you to all the digital services and streaming services. And, and, and so what did that landscape look like after the project was successful? How did um, you approach that piece? Yeah, so after the project was successful, we thought about actually releasing it and doing everything on our own. Right. And we're like, OK, we have the money. We can do everything on our own. But um, if we did it all on our own, we wouldn't have the worldwide reach. Right. We couldn't be in Germany and, you know, and have legs on the ground. So, so, we, so we wanted a distribution partner. Um, and with, with the Kickstarter campaign, we had an extreme amount of leverage because we, don't, we really only needed marketing dollars. We didn't right. need recording. We didn't need anything. Um, so the splits were tremendous. I mean, um, this is something I, I told Brandon. Like when I started this role in January, I was, I came from the business side of things, so streaming services, and so some of my former colleagues are distribution companies, and I, I sort of asked them about, it, and they were like, "Oh yeah, that deal was too good." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, bravo to you to be able to, not just have a successful campaign, but have the vision for how to make the overall business work to, yeah. that, to your benefit. Yeah, so, so, we, so we went with a company called Cobalt Music, um, and they're, they're our distribution company on, on the anonymous Nobody record. And um, they did an extreme job. Yeah. I mean, an extremely good job. Um, we, 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 had, we had a lot of choices, met with a lot of people, but they were the best company That's for awesome. what the guys wanted to do. Right. Um, and when the record came out, it was uh, number one rap yeah, record yeah, number and one number 12 record. on the overall album chart, which yes. is no small feat these days, especially when you have most of your sales for that week one as part of a pre-order. Yes. So there's a lot of trickiness that you have to just make sure that those sales are are credited properly, and, and the, the crediting um, bodies are always asking. They want to make sure that the music is the motivation for that sale, not the yeah. experience. And so sometimes those are things that we have to work with, with projects on to make sure that they get the most you know, credit for, for the campaign. Yeah. Um, but and it was nominated for a Grammy. Yeah, it was nominated I mean, for the Grammy, so that was just like. And this year was a hard year in the Grammy category, in yeah. the rap category. <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean, Kanye, Chance the Rapper, Schoolboy Q, DJ Khaled, De La Soul. But I think that, to me, it represents also the sort of, you know, the level of credit that De La Soul still deserves and is getting for a creative work that was on their terms, but also among this you know, new era of, of uh, artists, that they are just as significant and still influential and important. And, and I think that's a, a tremendous story uh, you know, that, that we at Kickstarter are, are extremely proud to be like, having played a tiny piece in that. Yeah. Um, and so now, you're obviously, they're playing tomorrow night at 1.25 yeah. uh, a.m. <laughs> <laughs> on Saturday. Uh, so be sure to be there. And what else do you have planned? I mean, they're on tour with Gorillaz and Yeah, so I'm, they, they have a string of dates. Um, De La Soul dates, and also on the tour, on tour with the Gorillas, and we're also in the process of recording a new album. Amazing. So yeah, yeah that's awesome. Yeah. So, recording a new album. Um, in a perfect world, we can get it out at the end of this year. Right. But, uh, yeah, you never know. Never, There's always yeah. a lot of people involved, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, yeah. So I mean. They're, they're, they're back on track. They're, they're almost like a new band. That's, I mean, that's, that's amazing. And I, I think that's if the, the main thing I would hope that we could take from this conversation is that you know, being brave, uh, looking at, at technology and new platforms and new pieces um, that maybe the industry isn't always ready to accept, but that can give you, as an artist, especially with a career, the amount of strength to start a new era, almost a restart yeah. 25 years later, is, is you know, really impressive. Um, so we have some time for questions, if anyone has a nice, polite audience here. <laughs> is there a microphone? I can repeat it back if you just say it. Oh, here. Contingency no. plan. <laughs> the question no, was, was there no, a contingency plan? No room for plan? failure. No, absolutely not. <laughs> failure is not an option. Yeah, once, once, once we went on that journey, there was no turning back. Like, we just had to figure it out. So, um, yeah, there's no contingency plan whatsoever. Have you had much reaction from the labels to this approach? Have they just gone like, 
era where labels we still do what we do or have they got to and gone hmm, this is quite interesting should we be doing this have you like had any reaction from them at all yeah the, a, a lot of people called me and asked me how does it work <laughs> um and I t like I tell everybody, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. Um, like, just to launch this campaign, we, we spent four to five months in planning right. just the launch of the so campaign. So that you wouldn't Yeah, fail, so, right. so, so that we wouldn't fail. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I don't, the, label, the labels, they, they, they were interested because, you know, it's, it's money that they don't have to spend if they can get it right. Yeah, it's a, it's a definitely different approach. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the labels are, they are curious about, about this as an option, but I think, you know, w when we look at how we can be part of strengthening the overall landscape and what we can offer, especially to sort of, there's career artists that are entrepreneurs, and yeah. that's what I, you know, how I see you all. And then there are artists that are getting their start. And, you know, the music business is sort of, like you were saying, kind of roll the dice. You yeah. know, even when you were at, at Columbia, like, you know, let's see how it goes. Let's spend a lot of money. And I think that if, if one thing that Kickstarter can be is sort of a, an option for wiser investment. Yeah. So, so, sorry, I can't hear. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my question is the collaboration with Kickstarter, how much does it have to do with PR along with crowdfunding? I mean, uh, crowdfunding through Kickstarter for an album, uh, it has a lot to do with PR as well, right? To reach out the audience. So I just want to know what is the kind of effect it has. He said PR? Yeah, so it, I, get the, I think the question was more like how much of the campaign was the, you know, raising the funds and how much it was it like having it be another marketing sort of point of, of uh, activation, you know, sort of like announcing the, the campaign was uh, a centralizing point. Yeah, it, it, it was actually both. Yeah. So part of, part of the Kickstarter campaign was to actually create awareness for the album. It was, it, 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 it was the first step in PR and marketing. Um, that's why it had to be successful, because if it wasn't successful... Then that would be a bad then, story. Yeah, yeah, the album would be a <laughs> flop. But, um, but yeah, it, it was definitely, it was the first step in PR to actually launch this product. Um, and as we hit our goals and as the number kept climbing, we, 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 we had a PR team in place right. That action, so we so we we would actually go pitch out every single day. Like as we hit another mark, we would go and do interviews. We we were on Bloomberg. We were in this magazine, that magazine, this blog, um, and it just elevated the release and just built more anticipation for an album that nobody knew about. Uh, hi there. I was just thinking about the uh, Valentine's giveaway, you know, the discography. Wasn't there any legal issues with it? Because if the music couldn't be made available in, let's say, legal platforms, uh, as you're promoting it, it's not like you're leaking it. I mean, you were announcing it. Wasn't there any legal issues with it? Um, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there was a risk, but, you know, that, that was the challenge. Okay, uh, a couple of questions. Well, you said that you got calls from different people asking uh, how to pull this trick on Kickstarter. Did you suggest them to start by giving away the catalog first? <laughs> no, I mean, I think for, I think for every artist it's different because everybody has a different story. So the, the only reason the De La, De La was able to give away their catalog is because it wasn't available. So their story was completely different. Um, and I honestly don't think, I don't know if Kickstarter is for everybody. I no. think it's for people that have a good enough story to tell. If you got a good story to tell, then I think you can really utilize the platform. I agree with that. Um, I think it's you, the artists that, that are successful with us are, you know, especially if they're career artists who have a fans and reputation and, yeah. you know, have those sorts of things to, to be concerned with. You, you have to be you have to be confident, and if you're sort of like going out there with to run a campaign, going, here's my camp, it's not gonna work. Yeah. Just don't do it. You know, find so. whatever whatever the the comfort zone is for you or your artist in that regard. But it that's we definitely support that 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 entrepreneurial spirit, I suppose. But, okay, uh, but do you think that actually giving it away predisposed the your fans better? 
to then actually uh, contribute on the Kickstarter campaign. Yes, yes, so yes. So it created a, first you gave and then you asked. Yes. But you were giving first. Yes, mm -hmm. so, so speak, speaking to that, um, there's actually a couple of projects that we did where we just kept on giving. So first we gave away the catalog. Um, then second, we, we, we created another campaign with BitTorrent where, where we created a, a mixtape with a producer that's not, now passed. Um, his name is Jay Dilla. Um, and we basically remixed a lot of the old songs with these Jay Dilla beats, and we gave that away to our fan base on, on, on BitTorrent. Then after that, we did another, we did another thing where um, on, on, on record day, on, on vinyl day, right, right, right. We, we, we created the scavenger hunt where we planted records all around the world in different record shops, and we gave out clues where people can go find these exclusive records. Um, can I just say that this, like, the creativity is kind of astounding, because it takes a lot of work to execute these yes. campaigns, right? Like, yes. not just buy-in, it's just like a lot. Yeah, and it, it you're takes doing it all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Good it's <laughs> it's it's them really, like yeah. because they lend to that kind of creativity. Like that's who they are. Like like other artists can't really do that because right. they don't. You know, they're more straightforward. But De La, they're like, yo, let's do it. You know what I mean? Like, like they're they're super experimental. I think it's really inspiring, though. I mean, I hope that other artists have have a chance to really dig in a little bit more as as business people and yes. creative people. You know, like obviously one doesn't work without the other. Yes. Um, but I, they're, they have set such a, an, an inspiring story that I, I hope people, you know, catch on to it. That's good. <laughs> That's good. OK. Oh, last question. You, you ended up with five more times Five Thank more you. money that you were expecting? Yes. What did you do with the rest of the money? <laughs> we, we, they made an amazing album. Yeah, we made the album <laughs> incredible. Um, but yeah, yeah, ha ha have, having extra funds just allowed us to do more. It, it allowed us to get Little Dragon, Snoop Dogg, Usher. It just allowed us to put more into the actual album. We can hire string sections. We can just do whatever we wanted to do If you haven't creatively. listened to it, listen to it, because it is a masterpiece. Yeah, it's, it's good. <laughs> it's really good. What Last was, question. Uh, thank you. What was the uh, most challenging aspect to manage what you did after the campaign? Because you managed that to succeed <laughs> in the campaign was a challenge. Uh, and you, man you, you mentioned that Cobalt is running uh, a collecting and distribution side of it. Yeah. Were there unexpected bumps or things? Oh that yeah, were yeah. We're 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 still going through those bumps okay. as of this day. So so the hardest thing is um, it's dealing with eleven thousand people. Yeah. And and it's and it's us, our small team, which is only three or four people communicating with eleven thousand people. That was extremely hard. Um, there there's certain tools that that we had communication like there's certain outside yeah. Kickstarter tools that, yeah, that, yeah. that were cool. They're like different kind of email platforms, but um, it's just a lot of people you have to communicate with. And the hardest thing, I've, I can tell you this, the hardest mm -hmm. thing is um, once people donate to a Kickstarter campaign, a lot of people, some people are super fans and some people, um, they want to hang in through the process, right? They, they're, they're, they're along for the whole ride. And some people just donated money, right? And they actually forgot about it. Right. So, so months later, they're like, oh, hey, I forgot I ordered this thing. And then they reach out like, hey, where's my stuff? They didn't answer the question. They didn't, yeah. Right. yeah. So, so, so every, all the people that donate money to the campaign, they had to, we sent them a questionnaire, and they had to fill out all the information. They had to give us the address, the phone numbers, everything, so we could actually send them the product. But a lot of people didn't do that. So that kind of follow-up, and you know, it's thousands and thousands of people that we have to keep following up with, which was extremely hard. And to this day, we're still doing that because right. some people they just forgot. They just forget. I know. I mean, it is. It's not unique, unfortunately. But it, but certainly, the the larger projects tend to have some some issues that you know you can't necessarily anticipate. And it's, yeah. It's frustrating, but yeah. And as a small team, I mean, we're not Amazon. You're tiny. No, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> you know what I mean. We don't have facilities, <laughs> so yeah. And it, it all it all matters. And I think that that's important too. You know, when when people are looking at at campaigns, I think certainly I've learned a lot from this experience because I was only there from the for the fulfillment piece. So you know, 
I have a lot of insight that, you know, probably I can benefit other people when I'm talking to them in the future. That's, you know, again, being renegades and leaders, you've sort of like forged the path and then, you know, other people benefit from your success. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Brandon. I really appreciate it. I hope you, I know you're not going to take a nap because you got to oh. adjust to the time zone, <laughs> but I hope you have a good day and we really appreciate the time and thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh.